Hello once again. Um, we are going to be doing something a little bit more ambitious than usual because I have a new table set up in my game room slash guest room. And as you can see, I have got Napoleon at Leipzig, the entire two map experience here set up because I'm going to try and tackle this entire box in one grand campaign. That's right. I'm going to be doing <clears throat> all um, three or four, depending on how you want to count it, scenarios. Two of the scenarios are actually joined if you use both maps of uh, the Battle of Leipzig uh, from the Library of Napoleonic Battles by Kevin Zucker and Operational Studies Group. You've seen me recently do coverage on four lost battles, and the reason uh, from this series, and the reason I am choosing to do Napoleon at Leipzig now is because Napoleon at Leipzig comes chronologically directly after those four lost battles. About a month has ended after the Battle of Denowitz, which I played at a convention and did a brief overview of in my Game On uh, series of videos about Game On Con, which happened over the summer in June. Well, a month has gone by since the end of that battle, and we are now going to be doing uh, the Battle of Leipzig, which uh, I believe, if someone correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not a Napoleonic historian, but it was the largest uh, battle uh, in history until World War I or World War II. I forget exactly uh, w what battle surpassed it, but it was just a massive, massive conflict a uh, massive piece of action uh, during the Napoleonic era um, in October of 1813. So we're going to give it a shot, and I'm going to be using everything here. Um, I'm going to be doing the grand campaign, which means that we're joining all the scenarios together. Um, we are going to be scoring the game as a grand campaign, uh, and that means using the victory point worksheets on each of the scenarios for uh, Liebert Volkwitz. Li Let's try that again. Liebert Volkwitz, which I believe is how you pronounce that. Wachau and Mockern and the Battle of Leipzig, and the Battle of Hanau, which is not going to be on this map. It's actually going to be on a smaller half size map um, that we will pull out when we are done here. But this is going to keep me busy for a while because we are doing all of this. Now, <clears throat> the Battle of Leipzig, I guess, collectively took place over uh, a few days. So October 14th, through the 19th. So we're actually going to be playing four full days on these two maps here. Uh, and then we will go uh, about 10 days later and do the retreat uh, at the Battle of Hanau. But what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be adding up the victory points from each of the scenarios. We're going to be carrying over the finishing state from that scenario to the next one in order. We're going to be adding up the victory points to that one. And we will get at the end of the Battle of Leipzig a, uh, a grand total and a winner. Um between the coalition and the French sides. Now, this is the initial setup. I'm choosing to start on October 14th for the batter, Battle of Lieber Volk, Liebert Volkwitz. That's going to catch me a lot. And uh, I will go through the setup and talk about that. But if you're interested in seeing some more Library of Napoleonic Battles, this is uh, a big, massive undertaking here. I'm not sure how long it's going to take me, but I'm very excited to do it. Um, and I got some new tables, and so I'm like, what's the best way to showcase these modular tables that I have uh, for my... Uh, game room slash guest room. And I was like, I really liked OSG's Library of Napoleonic Battles when I played it. I'm going to dive in more. Um, so we are going to be doing the grand campaign. There's some rules about that. Um, there are, I will, we'll talk about all the special rules as we go, and I will probably won't do them all up front. We'll break it down as we go scenario by scenario. But the other thing you should know is that I am going to use the cards. I figured let's just throw everything in. So I played with the cards at the Battle of Denowitz. Um, when I played Four Lost Battles face-to-face. -face. Um, and I'm not the biggest fan of the cards necessarily. I think they, um, they're a little weird. Um, they kind of like, Im to me, they kind of impede the flow of the game, but they do provide some nice variability, um, both to the setup and the way things work. And then in this particular game, Battle at Leipzig, there's actually some special rules that are dependent purely on the cards. Um, and so, uh, I figured instead of trying to play around all that, um, I would just use the cards and I would show you how those work. Now, in OSG's uh, Library of Napoleonic Battles right now, they've changed the way that the cards work. Usually games would come with their own deck. And that was the case with my copy of Napoleon at Leipzig. There is a French deck, and you can see it says Napoleon at Leipzig down here, and there's a coalition deck as well. Now with the system, there's just a global deck. So um, you don't get a deck with each game. You should purchase the deck separately, or buy the, I think there's a game that OSG sells that comes with both decks. But basically they're called a universal card deck. And the cards in the deck um, can be tailored to each game in the series. And so if you go online, there's a little sheet that tells you what cards to take out or what cards do what, depending on the game you're playing. And otherwise, all of the cards in the deck will work with every game. Makes it much more streamlined and much simpler rather than having a deck of cards for each game. However, I do have the deck for Napoleon at Leipzig, and so we're going to use those specific decks because all the cards I need are in here. So we'll be talking about that and playing with that. Um, obviously, I will be seeing both hands of cards since I'm playing solo, but that's okay. Um, there's still a lot of variability going on in this. <clears throat> 
And then, yeah, we'll be, we'll be going through this entire thing. Um, I hope you're ready, and I hope that uh, this becomes a really fun experience. I've had to bust out a lot of uh, side display space. Um, I'll show you that. I've got the casualty, rec tracker rec uh, casualty records tracks down here um, for t losses, and uh, we'll get to that. And then down on this table down here, we've got the turn tracks. There's actually a turn track for each uh, side in this game. Um, here's the, uh, the boxes for um, the... Um, uh, eliminated units and reduced strength units. So we've got the British turn track here. We're starting on October 14th. We've got the French here. You can see the reinforcements that are going to be coming in this turn. That's on top of any alternate reinforcements. Um, <clears throat> the Battle of Liebert Voltkwitz is going to start at 10 a.m. and go all the way to 6 p.m. Uh, and then we're going to stop. So some of the campaign rules here are going to mean that there are going to be days such as October 15th, which are optionally playable. Um, but I am going to choose not to play them because historically there was no action on those days. And so we're just going to use the campaign rules that say if you skip a day, you just leave the units where they were at the end of the previous day and add the new units that would have come in that day. Um, and so then we will go October 14th, we will skip the 15th, we will go 16th, we'll, I believe we'll skip the 17th, and then we'll go 18, 19 for the actual Battle of Leipzig itself. We've got weather. We'll talk about that as we go. I've got my die rolling. we got some the counters over there. It's going to be a great time. Um, so let's, let me show you exactly what we've got going on here. We've got two full-size maps um, that depict the area around Leipzig, Germany, here, um, all the way out to the north and the south. And um, generally speaking, um, there are going to be several areas of engagement on this map. So starting on the 14th, the Battle of Liebert Volkwitz, which is here, is going to be between uh, Murat, who's here, the 5th Corps, the 2nd Corps, the... Uh, fifth cavalry, I believe Murat is also on top of. There's another leader in here that's on top of someone else. There's there's a lot of French units mixed in here. Uh, here's uh, the ninth corps, um, and then we've got uh, Ponatowski with the eighth corps, and Kellerman with the first cav. So there's a lot of French units kind of all interspersed in here. Um, they were ordered to essentially take up a line and protect the southeast approach to Leipzig. On the other side, we've got the coalition here. We've got Kleist and his Prussians. They're kind of scattered all over the place, and we've got. Um, uh, Klenau and the Austrians, who are under command of, of uh, Schwarzenberg, I believe. Yeah, Schwarzenberg, who is not on the map yet, but will be coming on the map. And we've also got the Russians uh, here under Barclay. And under Barclay, we have got uh, Wittgenstein in W Corps. Um, and so these um, these sort of coalition uh, formations are sort of making their, their uh, way up this way towards Leipzig. And historically, what ended up happening was a recon in force by W Corps. And um, they got a late start, and so the French knew they were coming. And um, there was uh, a battle here around Liebert Volkwitz along this line. And uh, famously, I guess, Murat uh, used mass cavalry charges against the approaching coalition units um, to try and stop them and drive them off. So that happens on October 14th. Then there's going to be a lull in the combat, and we're going to go a day. And what's going to happen starting on the 15th is going to be sort of um, the beginnings of the Battle of Leipzig proper. And that's where we're going to come up here. And that's where you can see these fortifications... Uh, that have been set up by the coalition, and we're going to get Blucher and his Prussians, a massive number of them, coming on from this direction. You can see one of the supply sources for the coalition coming down this road as it leads towards Leipzig itself. Now, Leipzig is uh, considered, has five hexes. It's a larger city, and they're all considered chateau hexes, so it's going to be a tough nut uh, to crack to get in there. Arigi is in here with the uh, LO Corps, and um, this is sort of like a scrapes together garrison that is going to defend the city. You probably don't want to be having him leave the city, but you can see that some of the outskirts are going to be worth a lot of victory points. We've got Lindenau, uh, Mockern, which is um, the battle that took place on the 15th, and um, yeah, there's Brettenfeld, Radefeld. So there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of considerations here because the French are basically going to be attacked from this direction and the French are going to be attacked from this direction as well. And so they're going to try and defend Leipzig as much as possible. Now, because we're playing the two map uh, campaign scenario, we do get to start October 14th um, with uh, Marmont's 6th Corps um, on the field northeast of Leipzig. And they are allowed to activate and move on this first day. And so um, I am guessing what I'm going to want to do with them is uh, I'm going to want to move them in this direction to get them in position uh, so that the Prussians can't get into these fortifications very easily, um, or at least not prepare sort of a, a defense 
uh, there. So we're going to want to probably move in this general direction um, and sort of provide some friction as the approach to Leipzig happens from the north starting in the future scenarios. But to begin with early, we're really only focused on this map here and everything that's going on sort of southeast of the city. Um, you can see the lovely map artwork as well. I love the maps in this series. They're fantastic. Uh, Charlie Kibler did these. And uh, yeah, and so some of the hot spots around here, we're going to see uh, Liebert Volkwitz itself is worth 10. That's going to be a huge target. Uh, Wachau here is worth five. Um, and then this is, oops, uh, Mark Lieberg. And that is going to be worth five as well. I messed up Kellerman here. Kellerman's got some poles with him. He starts right there. Yeah. So as you can see, a lot of units on the map, a lot of stuff. I'm going to have to be cognizant when I'm playing that uh, I have other sort of uh, theaters in the battle that I'm going to have to be worried about. So it's not just the, the zoomed in view of just southeast of Leipzig. If stuff starts to go wrong here, I may think about pulling back and getting into more defensible positions. You can see there's a lot of ridges that are going to block artillery fire. There are some special rules in this campaign that are going to have to do with ammunition. There's going to be ammunition shortage challenges potentially for both sides. Um, as we bombard with our artillery, there's going to be card events that are going to come out. I'm very excited to tackle this. I really like this system, and I'm really excited to see how it plays on this two-map scale here, which is something I have not yet done, um, but am eager to tackle. So uh, with that out of the way, uh, I think we'll get started. I'm not going to go into too much detail about everything that you need to know about the special rules. We'll talk about them as they happen, and we'll capture the action and, and what's going on. Um, early on, it's going to be a lot of localized stuff down here, but I will definitely be zooming out to give you a larger picture of what's happening over the battlefield as we move forward. And I will tell you about the cards as we start. So look forward to that. Um, is there anything else I need to tell you about? I don't think so at this moment. Um, yeah, either uh, put on your bike horns, uh, I guess, and uh, pick a side because it's going to be epic. All right, we were all set up to go here 10 a.m. I rolled weather. We got fair weather for this first turn, and then we rolled two dice for weather in this game, and we checked to see what that other die indicates when we check weather again. It turned out I rolled a five, so in three turns we'll check weather again. But as you can see, 50-50 that we get uh, fair weather. Hopefully we don't get frost, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's going to start good. Uh, so that that out of the way, now we have to figure out our setup, our, our mode card setup. So the decks of cards in this game are broken into two types. There's your regular deck, which you're going to go into your hand and you're going to play with those. But then these are these mode cards, and each deck has six of these. And these affect the historical setup in just slightly different ways to give you some variability to how you start. Now, I could skip this and not do and just do the historical setup as we have it, but I think it's there's some fun to be had here with some to already get history kind of off the rails. So um, I'll show you how this works. So the scenario dictates how many mode cards you draw. So in this scenario, it says the coalition start with two from their deck and the French start with one. And at this point, both sides would look at these and they would just play them in number order right here, right? So here's what we get. The French got, so they're four, they're first, they're going to go here. They're going to get replacements. Your army receives replacements, invert any reduced strength units of your choice in supply to their full strength side. Well, actually that doesn't take an effect, any effect because there are no reduced strength units to start this uh, particular battle. So we can ignore that. Now, what you're looking at here with these cards is that um, they have a title, they've got these numbers, they've got a victory point adjustment, a, a, um, or sorry, type, um, these numbers, victory point adjustment, a title, and the effect, okay? Now, these are mode cards, and the other ones will say different things. They'll say tactics cards, march cards, that's, and so forth, but they all kind of look the same. These victory points, uh, so every turn, you're going to be forced to play a card from your hand. You have to play a card. Some of these cards give you positive victory points, usually because their effect is not ideal, or in this case, they give you negative victory points because they give you some advantage, at, like at this one at the start of the game, you could flip reduced strength units, but you would take a minus one VP penalty. At the end of the, of, of the scenario, you're going to look at all the cards you've played in the scenario, and you're going to total up the victory points on all those cards. Both sides are going to do that. So this is an additional uh, victory point condition that comes into play when you use the cards that is not present when you don't use the cards. So I just want to point that out. This number here, very important. This represents the amount of movement points specific unit types have. So unlike the normal game where units use their printed movement value, in this game, uh, you're going to use these values on the card you play for the turn. And this represents a little bit of uncertainty about how far units can move, how fast they can move. It becomes less deterministic, almost kind of like great campaigns in the American Civil War where you're not quite sure. Some of these cards will have reduced movement allowances. Some of them will have extended movement allowances. But the way you read this is... The first number before the slash is infantry and artillery. That's how far they can move. In this particular instance, it actually matches up with the infantry uh, and artillery movement uh, allowances that the units have normally. Um, and then the second number after the slash is cavalry movement. <clears throat> 
And so cavalry and horse-drawn artillery will have six. Now, in this case, the card is four six. That's the default standard, so I can look at the counter and remember. Light cavalry, uh, as you can see, there's a light cavalry unit here. They always have plus one to whatever this number is here. So um, we'll just put this off to the side to show that that is going to be the first turn's movement allowance. I don't really need the reminder, but I'll put the, the, the discard pile here. So we've played those. Now... We do early arrival. So we look at this, it's negative one VP. It says all friendly at start forces on the map are in command for the first turn. Well, that is massively huge for the coalition because that means that um, Klenau here, who's, whose core is like slowly arriving from the east, you'll notice that most of these, in fact, from here back, all of these units would have started out of command, which would have been very problematic for the Austrians to get organized for this uh, sort of recon and force towards Liebert Volkwitz. But now, because we've got early arrival, uh, these guys are all going to be in command automatically. The same goes for all the Russian units. The same goes for all of Kleist's Prussians. And that's particularly huge because Kleist is extremely scattered. He's got, um, a, he's got a, a, a brigade, it looks like, there. He's got a, a cavalry division out here. And he's got uh, an artillery regiment um, or platoon out here. So as you can see, all of those units would have had to roll individual activations and they're twos. They're not very good. So with Kleist being in command for this first turn, he's going to be able to organize these forces, which is like huge, huge for the coalition. So we're going to keep that. The next thing we look at is this here, this formation scattered. So th <laughs> this is going to be hilarious. Let me, uh, let me take a pause and show you, it's sort of set up to show you exactly how this card works. Okay, so let's take a look at this card. And also, one thing I should mention, by the way, um, the first player is supposed to play their cards first. So in this particular um, game, the coalition actually goes first. So they should have played their five and their six first before the French played theirs. But you always play in numbered order within your faction. So they would have gone five, six for the coalition, then the French would have done this. Now, as it happens, it doesn't matter that it was out of order, but just keep that in mind. I messed that up a little bit. All right, so let's take a look at this card. So the second rule I need to tell you is that the second mode card play actually determines your movement allowance. So you'll notice that the coalition played two, but in this particular example, we're gonna use this one because it's the second one played um, and we're gonna use this movement allowance. So on the first turn, the coalition is going to have um, the movement, uh, an increased movement allowance, which is great. What's not so great is the effect of this card, formation scattered. Pick, although it is somewhat historically plausible, which is kind of cool. So pick one friendly force. Now the rules around that mean you have to pick the, the single force that is on the map that has got the most strength points, that is the strongest formation. And so unfortunately that's going to be Wittgenstein's K core or W core, excuse me. Um, I have to place all of the units of that force in my hand, raise it uh, a foot off the table and uh, above the, um, on the area where they're deployed. And then I have to open my hand and let the units fall onto the map. And that's where they're gonna start the scenario. Um, which is pretty hilarious. Um, I really like that. I think this is a cool effect. Um, and then if they're touching, they can be stacked. Um, you put them inside the hexes that they fell in. Uh, I can decide if they're straddling a hex side and they can't be in impassable terrain in an enemy zone of control or across a river. Uh, that would make them separated from that force. So functionally, <laughs> what that means here is that I need to pick up all of these Russian units and basically drop them over this little highland area and see where they start. So instead of starting in the historical setup, we're going to start them a little bit more scattered than they would have been, which does make a little bit of sense because this, this order, this recon, they should have done it the day before and they didn't. They were slow getting going. The coalition couldn't get the orders out. They couldn't get organized. And so this, I think, represents a little bit of that pretty nicely. So um, I'll do that on camera. Let me gather all the units up. Okay, here we are. Here's Wittgenstein's W Corps, all the Russians. And we're going to just kind of shake it up in my hand. Oh boy, I'm already, I'm already displacing units. We're going to shake it up in my hand. We're going to kind of drop it over this general area. I need to be, it said, um, about a, a foot above. So here we go. Um, here comes the scattered formation uh, to start the game. <laughs> oh, got one more in my hand. All right. Oh boy. Okay. Well, that is, that's not very good. All right. So these, these guys obviously cannot be put out here because they're across a major river over here. Um, we've got Russians scattered to the four winds. Like these guys are going to have to not be in a zone of control. So I'll move them back. Uh, but there you go. That's, uh, some of the, some of the things that can happen when you uh, play with the mode cards here. Um, I think this is kind of fun. I guess, I guess, you know, if you're trying to be really competitive about it, uh, this system maybe is not the right system for you in general, but, or you just play without the cards. Um, but, you know, at least we get increased movement this turn uh, for, for the coalition and they get to go first. So um, it also negates, by the way, the VP penalty on the previous card. So they're flat zero, whereas the French are at minus one. Although that actually, that didn't count because they couldn't do the effect. So actually the French have no penalty. So we're going to start at zero VPs. Um, let me get this cleaned up <laughs> and then I'll show you what happens and where the Russians are going to begin.
Okay, so we got good news and we got bad news for the Russians. The good news is that most of their actual combat forces are um, in sort of a similar position to the way they started. They're a bit closer to the enemy, the French, than they probably wanted to be, but that wouldn't, you know, that is something that could have happened from a blundered recon. Um, so we're going to start here in these positions. Um, we've got some Russians over here. Thankfully, they're all going to be in command for the first turn because of the because of the early arrival card. Uh, they arrived early, but not organized. So these units are going to have to move and try and get in position. The bad news for the Russians is that Wittgenstein himself is all the way over here, um, <laughs> which means uh, he is going to have to get back into the command range of a bunch of these uh, units so that the following turn he can actually order them, which is problematic. The other problematic thing here is that the W Corps supply train is all the way back here. It is out of range of this front area. It's actually out of range of these guys over here. Um, so it's also going to have to get a move on, but it doesn't have very many movement points. I think it may be able to get as far as Mukern. Um uh, on this first turn. Um, so the W Corps supply is going to probably have to be drawing from the second corps, the, uh, yeah, Clay second corps, which I believe is allowed, um, or they could potentially draw from the Austrian, um, fourth corps here. So anyways, there you go. That is the setup complete for the first turn and sort of what we're looking at in terms of, uh, the opening hour of, uh, the battle of Liebert Volkwitz and, uh, some of the chaos that the cards can introduce into the game. Uh, and by the way, I should mention now that the mode cards have been drawn, these just get put back in the box. You, the mode cards that did not get picked, um, are just, there's no effect with them anymore. Um, it's a one-time thing in the game and, uh, we will move forward. Um, on turn two, each side's going to get to draw some bonus cards from their normal deck. Um, and then... Um, we'll go from there.